Hello and welcome again to our weekly Parsha Shear with the commentary of the al College. This week, the, uh, the uh, Shear is dedicated for Orei Chaim ben Chaya Yehudis, to have Rufu Shlema, Rufu Chaim ben Sora, to have Rufu Shlema, and sadly, uh, to mark the passing of two exceptional young ladies, well, maybe not so young, but I remember them as being young ladies, Toba ben Reb Chaim Mahilo, and Sarit Rachel ben Reb Yitzchok David, um, both of whom I knew very well. Tova um, uh, Yudekin was Tova Gittelson, and she was uh, a young lady who used to come and help my late wife and I when we were living in Gateshead on a Thursday night, get ready for Shabbos. And uh, Sarit Rachel, uh, that's Sarit Fulda, who was Sarit Lopian, uh, sadly both living in Manchester, sadly passed away this last, this in these last few days. Their families should only have Nahoma and only happy and proud memories. Uh, if you'd like to sponsor the shear um, for somebody who's passed away, uh, then please uh, do get in touch. And uh, as usual, it's yy, the rabbi yy.com. And of course, it doesn't have to be for a sad occasion. It can be celebrated with Simcha um, as well, or any other good Jewish reason. This is Parsha, it's Parsha Shema. Let's move on to the second book of the Torah. Again, let me remind you that this is the second series of the al and therefore, there is another share from last year, which you can access. And we're tackling, obviously, different topics every year. This topic, I thought, this year, I thought that the topic would be interesting for us to tackle. Is Moshe Rabbeinu, after he flees from Mitzrayim, after he's killed an Egyptian guard who's trying to kill a Jew, and he has to flee, and he finds refuge eventually in the house of the man who's going to become his father-in-law, Yisro, but not only his father-in-law, but one of the greatest Jews he becomes a Jew and becomes one of the greatest Jews of all time. Uh, as I've told you many times in the Shirim, Rabbi Desta says in Miktam Eliyahu, if you're named in the Torah, that means you're an exceptional person, an outstanding person. That doesn't mean to say a great person in the sense of a wonderful person. Paro, after all, is named in the Torah and he was anything but a wonderful person. However, it means that you are outstanding and exceptional. But to have a whole portion named after yourself, that's something beyond the normal. And Yisro, when he becomes Jewish, contributes so much to the Jewish people that the Torah changes its shape, its form, as a consequence to accommodate a Pasha Yisro, which uh, is the story of him. But we meet him for the first time uh, openly uh, in this week's Pasha. So let's uh, get down to brass tacks. I should say, incidentally, for those who join me every week, um, I sometimes monitor uh, the, uh, the number of people watching this year. And also the time of the share. Last week's share was 58 minutes, nearly a whole hour. Now I'm trying to work out really if that's a bit too long, uh, and maybe 45 to 50 minutes is about the the appropriate uh, length of the share for uh, my listeners. Please, if you'd like to contact me, I'd be very happy to uh, uh, tailor, reduce, or keep it uh, slightly longer. Uh, it depends how much you like the Alshak, I suppose. Uh, so anyway, so let's uh, di- uh, uh, dip straight into the Pasha. And this is in, pa- in, in Pasha Shmois, it's in the second chapter. And I think we can start quite happily uh, if we look in at verse 15. So I'm not going to put it up on the screen. Uh, please get hold of a Chumash or I'll uh, translate as we go along. I'll certainly slow down when we get to the particular psukim that the Alshak is going to be uh, casting his gaze on in this week's Parsha. So here we go. So it says the following thing. Um, uh, if I can uh, just get hold of the, if I take my glasses off, it's always, I'm afraid, it's uh, always easier to see without your glasses, uh, if you've got eyesight like mine. Well, look on Midian Sheva Bona. So Moshe has fled from Paro. So maybe we'll go back to the fleeing. The Yishma Paro Esadover as a Paro hears about Moshe's killing of the, of the Egyptian who was taskmaster who was beating the Jew. Uh, he is not uh, best pleased, to put it mildly. Uh, and he tries to kill Moshe. And Moshe flees. And Moshe flees from Para. And he dwells in the land of Midian. And he's sitting by, by a well. Okay. Which, of course, is, the, is where he's going to uh, meet the woman who he is going to eventually come to marry, but we'll get to that in the next the next psukim. Well, the current median share the bonus, and the current median had seven daughters, but Averno, but Atlena, they would cut and they came, and, and, uh, and they drew water, but Amlena is a rechotim, and they filled the water troughs, Lahashkas Sain Aviam, to water the flock of their father. 
the Yobo Haroim, and along came shepherds, the Yagorshum, and they, now, uh, as usual, I'll, I'll leap over, I'm reading from my little uh, art scroll here, and as you know, it's a bit naughty, but I often like to see what they say, especially if I know the al is likely uh, to disagree. But anyway, it says, the Yagorshum, and they uh, chased them away, I think we're going to translate that as, let's see, drove them away. Okay, the Yagorshum, and again, as so often is the case, uh, uh, I'm sure I've pointed out uh, relentlessly, that when you translate into one language, every translator is a commentator, uh, and sometimes you lose a lot in a translation, uh, because uh, English doesn't really, uh, doesn't use the pronouns and so on and so forth, don't reveal the gender. We often lose the gender of the original language, if it has, if it uses gender, and uh, and lose context as a consequence. The Yigarshum is in the masculine. It should be, be as the al will point out, the second be Yigarshum, which would be the feminine form. Anyway, the, the, he drove, they drove them, women, away. The Yaka Moshe of Yashian, and Moshe gets up and saves them. Saves them from what? Being driven away? Saving is a bit of an uncomfortable word for just somebody being driven away and he stops from being driven away. Anyway, the Yashik is the Tzadam and he gives or waters their Tzadam, their flock. But the Vano El Royal, and they come to rule of Ehem, the Yomar Madu, Maharam, the Bahayam, why are you back to Maharton Bahayam? Why are you back so quickly today? But the Mana Ishmid Sri had Tzadam Yad Harayim. An Egyptian man saves us from the shepherds, the Gam Dolo Dolo, and he drew, drew. Dolo Dolo. Uh, he drew twice, Lono, the Ashkas and so on, and he watered the flock. Then there's a little bit more, and the Posit tells us how bad it was for the Jews in the shrine. And then it returns and tells us, Umoisha Hoya Roy is sorry, Yisra Hosnam. In between then, it says that Yisra gives his daughter hand in marriage to Moshe. There's a million bits of, of, of seconds of history that's uh, elapsed between the two. Um, anyway, so. Uh, uh, the, the, there's only a hint of what going, what's going on here. Maybe I'll read a little bit more before I start jumping. Uh, and it says, the Yol Moshe the Shev, the Isha Moshe was happy to live with the man. Um, and he gives his daughter Tzipporah's hand in marriage. But the Medrash says that, matter of fact, uh, Yisro terrified of the reaction of, of Para if he realizes that he has, uh, he's been uh, offering sanctuary to uh, a fugitive, Egyptian uh, justice, then he would be in serious trouble. So he put Moshe in prison and he was really left there to rot. Had it not been for the intervention, the secret intervention of Sephora, Yusra's daughter, and during that 10 years, that secret liaison with, of course, Moshe behind bars, but despite that fact, there are conversations, they're changed, she embraces Judaism and eventually becomes his wife. That itself is filling in a, an interesting gap uh, because when we go to say that. Moshe was content to dwell, dwell with the man and becomes the, the shepherd of, of Yisrael, uh, then there's obviously a lot of time has passed. Anyway, let's uh, see what the Alshach has to say on that. And I want to share with you this week, because I'm going to share the Alshach, I'm sure I won't mind, sharing last week the Alshach we shared uh, Rabbi Rucham. Um, and this week we're going to share a sefer called Ber Yosef. Ber Yosef is a wonderful sefer, of Yosef Salant. And I've got something to tell you that he has to say here as well, which I think you will enjoy. Uh, anyway, so let's do some classic Alshik analysis of the Pesukim we've just read. And we're only going to really analyze uh, Posuk Tes uh, Zion, that's uh, 16 and, and the New Zion and 17, only two Pesukim. But this will give you, especially if you're joining us for the first time, a very uh, classic insight as to how the Alshik views this. Now, um, there is, because in my Alshach, it numbers them. No, it doesn't number I number them. Well, I number them anyway. So he's got about 10 questions here to ask in just two psukim. Because, of course, nothing escapes nothing escapes his, uh, his uh, analysis, bearing in mind that the author of the book is no less than Hashem Yisborach, written down by his scribe, Moshe Rabbeinu. Um, and God's very good at Hebrew, as I sometimes make, as I sometimes quip. However, I've been quite serious, and therefore there are no words that are extra no misspellings, no typos. So therefore, when a word or a, a, a posik says something in a certain way, it's meant to, it's significant, it signifies. And if it doesn't make sense, you've got to ask yourself the question, well, why does that not make sense? To find out why it's written that way. 
and you get a whole new perspective, a whole new insight. So here we go. <coughs> Roy lost his slave, and the Alshaka almost always starts that way, and says this, it's fitting that you should consider. This means he's about to advance a number of observations or questions for your attention, leaving you often think to yourself, oh, why didn't I spot that? But it says, Lama Yispar Lona should Veno, but at Leno, but to Veno, but at Leno, but to Maleno. Why does it say that they came and they drew water and they filled the trough? If they came to the bear and they filled the trough, by definition, they drew water. I don't have to say that. Magam Molas at Leno. Um, so when it said that they drew the, that's uh, they drew the water, uh, they drew the water. That is part of the, when they filled the trough. They must have drawn the water. Two, the odd omrut soina behem. This is very interesting. A careful analysis says that they they, they drew the water, filled the trough to lahashkus tsoin avihem to fill or to water the flock of their father. But after that, it changes and doesn't call it the flock of the father. The Yoba Haroim, and then of course along come the shepherds and chase them away, or what was they, what did they say? Uh, I can't remember what the arts girls said, but to read them and say, oh, and uh, I've turned the page. That's what I'm saying. Drove them off, drove them off, and drove them off. Um, but anyway, it says, there when it says, the Yoba Haroim, the Yagosham, and drove them off, the Yoko Moshe, the Yishim, the Yishak, Estonam. And Moshe comes and he waters their flock. I thought it was the flock of their father. No, it's their flock. Later on, and just in the next Pasuk, uh, when they report what went on to Yisro, then it just calls them the flock. And it doesn't ascribe the ownership of the flock. So the ownership of the flock in the first case is the father's flock. Suddenly it's the girl's flock. And then just the flock. So the Alshaka is intrigued by the Torah. No extra words, no mistakes. Uses three different terms for this flock of sheep. Then the odd, another question. Yeah, is what I was talking about before. Uh, when it says they drove them off, the Yegoshum is in the masculine, it should be the Yegoshun, as we said before. But royal hair, because of Kirishina, Hoya Aymarki, Hain, Molo, Haritan, the Lashka Stein, it says that they filled the, the trough for the, for the sheep to. Uh, to drink from, but after it says Moshe did it. They themselves gave testimony or reported to the father. The Egyptian, i.e., Moshe, was dressed like an Egyptian, so they thought he was an Egyptian. Moshe did that. So which one was it? So here's Al the Alshik says some incredibly interesting things, and it's beautifully observed. I think you would agree. And he says the following thing: On the Yomer, ki hikar bahen sneers. Moshe Beno, no. I have to go back to the previous post which I, I skipped over a little bit. Remember, it said that Moshe fled Paro. It says, Vayesh, I'll read that to you again. Um, Vayesh of the Eretz Midian, and he's dwelling or he's living in the land of Midian. Vayesh of the Er, and he's sitting by this, by this Be'er. Now, along come Yisra's daughters. Now, a little bit of background, I think, that we need because that's it's going to uh, be essential to make sense to what's going on. In, this, in the Parsha of Yisra, Rashi famously says that he had seven names and that he had been the high priest to every idolatrous religion in the world at the time. And I mentioned before that this is the first time we openly meet Yisro, but he's certainly been there in the story before because in the beginning of Shemaz, very Aleph, it's the Hova Neskatmala bit, which we talked about in last year, uh, year's Al Shashir, when Paro has a, a, hatches a plan in order to uh, a, seduce the Jewish people to abandon their own religion, leaving them uh, deserted by God, because the deal is, Hashem says, if you want to tell me to go away and leave you alone, I will. So if we desert him first, then he says, okay, that's what you want me to do, I'll leave you. That left us vulnerable to attack. That was exactly why they planned, and incidentally, that's an idea that repeats itself very uh, several times through Jewish, Jewish history, to get the Jews to abandon their own religion, and then they are removing their own protection. They've taken on their own, their own uh, off their own bulletproof vest before walking into the uh, uh, before walking into a hail of bullets, which is pointing at their hearts. Um, in this case, with regards to uh, to Paro's idea, it came to him from one of his three chief advisors. So the three chief advisors to Pharaoh, one was called Bilam. Of course, we meet him in the Pasha of Bullock, 
when he, he was the chief advisor of, of, of Paro, and it was him who came up with the idea of getting the Jews to give up their religion by being extremely nice to them. I'm sure you've heard me say this show before, if you really hate Jews, and I mean really hate Jews, be nice to them. Because it's the societies that are the nicest to the Jews that see the greatest attrition rate, assimilation rate, and disappearance rate of the Jewish people that you detest so much. So that's a very good tactic. And that's exactly what Bilam suggested. And then after they've lost their protection from Hashem, the brutal, nasty bit of the, of the exile kicks in, of the oppression kicks in. But there was two other advisors. When this plot was suggested by Bilam to Paro, uh, then it was two other uh, uh, advisors was Yisro, uh, whom we're talking about now, Moshe's father-in-law to be, and the other one was Eov, Job, Job's the suffering of the Bible. Eov, all prophets, obviously, um, uh, or on the level of prophecy, not quite prophets. Uh, uh, certainly Eov is. Uh, and uh, at least I think he is. I'm thinking about that as we talk. But let's leave that aside. I'll have to research. Was Eov a prophet? Mm. Okay, let me think about that one. Uh, anyway, so basically, uh, Eov's reaction is interesting. Eov's reaction is he says nothing. And it's interesting um, that many, many people have complained that it's the people who sit back and do nothing that allow the bad people to prosper. Uh, so maybe his silence actually was a loud shout of acquiescence, or at least turning a blind eye to what was going on. But Yisro could not turn a blind eye, blind eye. He couldn't do anything about it, but he runs away. I cannot be part of this. I will not allow my name to be associated with this. And that's why Yisra is a Midian in the first place. Midian is generally identified as Saudi Arabia today, and he left Mitzrayim, flees to Saudi Arabia, that area, and that's where the story takes place. Munch himself flees also. Maybe it was a, a famous place to run away to, um, because as there are some countries today, like Switzerland, we flee from America, I believe there's no extradition. Uh, it, maybe that was, maybe I'm just speculating, uh, maybe in a silly fashion, really. Uh, but certainly, Moshe comes there as well. Okay. Now, with that in mind, he has abandoned uh, all of the idolatrous practices of Egypt. But not only that, because Rashi said he had been the high priest to every idolatrous religion that existed in the time. He joins it. He rises in the ranks to, as I say, he's the high priest, sees that it's nonsense, sees that it's foolish and, or, or evil, rejects it and goes on to the next one, the next one, and the next one. He's desperately seeking the truth, desperately seeking the truth. Uh, and eventually he finds it, and they say he becomes a Jew. But in that state of rejection of the idolatrous beliefs of the people amongst who he lives, he's not popular. It's not a popular decision. They see him as a heretic. They see him as a traitor uh, to the idea, ideas, ideals, and philosophy of the general world. And that's why his daughters a, are in uh, are going to be subjected to attack as a reflection of their general contempt for the belief of this renegade family, this non-Jewish family, who are looking for the truth, which is not the counterfeit nonsense of idolatry. So let's, with that as the background, let me read a little, little bit of the Asha to you. On the Miyomer, ki heker behen sneers. The Moshe Rabbeinu is sitting by the well, which these girls, these shepherdesses, come to, uh, and he recognizes immediately in them sneers modesty because it's interesting this it's the way he says of women when they come to the air it's a very social people coming to the well and no running water of course that's what people would socialize would get together you'd meet your neighbors you'd meet people at the well drawing water and you would often in, in, engage them in, com in conversation i know when these uh, young women come and they see this stranger here and not just stranger a strange man uh, it's it's obviously interesting. He has to be intriguing to them. And that's what he says. He's a stranger. He's a foreigner. Shalom him. And he doesn't come from their, their land. Normal thing for them to do would be to say, who are you? Where, where do you come from? Which part of Egypt do you come from? Uh, at least have some sort of conversation. Hello, how are you? Who are you? Um, but they don't, because that's what the Alsha points out. What does it say? And they came, and they drew water. No more, she's sitting there all the time. 
where he said Moshe was sitting there. And they don't engage him in conversation. So Moshe immediately sees and not Sneas, a, a, a very, very important quality. Sneas applies to both men and women, certainly for women. Um, and he sees that important uh, and unusual quality in, in, in that world, modesty, sexual modesty, modesty and barriers between the genders. That's a uniquely Jewish value. It certainly was in that, in, in that world. Uh, the imizer ata, and they don't engage in conversation. But the general social interaction you would expect, the normal uh, interaction between the genders that you would expect, and Rashi famously says in Pasha's Kadoshim, wherever you find barriers separating the genders, that's where you find automatically holiness. So there's an indicator there, a the sign flashing to Moshe Rabbeinu, these are unusual people, these young women. Ki'im v'tavena, they came, the miyat adleno, v'tavena, and they immediately draw the water and they fill the trough. They don't start talking. And neither side, Moshe doesn't talk to them and they don't talk to Moshe. They didn't speak to him because they were embarrassed, they were shy, they were, they were sneistic. But there, the Yoshevel there, and that's what I say, Moshe is sitting in that bear, okay, Shosko, Yachto, Vedvena, Kabuduba. And they sat there and they each one did whatever they were doing. The woman have already explained, but say what Moshe was doing, but they didn't engage in, in social interaction, they didn't engage in conversation. And indeed, in the firm world today, that's exactly what would happen. If you're standing at a bus stop in Yerushalayim, uh, yeshiva bocher, and there's some seminary girls there, or a seminary girl there. Um, it might be in the, the normal world, world to just to gently say hello. Uh, that's not what would happen. There's a value which is being reflected here. The barriers between the genders that Rashi says, which innately invites Kedusha. So, the Oig Shem is another point here. So you might think, oh, maybe it's because he's a foreigner, maybe they're just racist or chauvinist or uh, nothing wanted nothing to do with this strange looking fellow. Uh, but really the, the shepherds from their own country, uh, they were friendly with them. No, because immediately, what did they say? They filled the, the water and the Yovah Haroim and Yoshim. And along come the Roim and they immediately throw them away. We're going to see, or drive them away. And we're going to see exactly what, they, what really went on there in just a few seconds time. So it's not that they, you know, they spoke to the men. The men hated them. These were heretics. These are women that rejected the gods, and therefore they wanted nothing to do with them. They had nothing in common with them. They shared no beliefs with them. That's why That's why they drove them away. That's why Moshe interposes himself between them, saying that the values of these young ladies reflect Jewish values, and he comes to their rescue. And uh, and Moshe then intervenes. And he thought in the, in the slightest of concern that they might kill him. Uh, this is a mitzvah. You've got to protect people like that, protect, protect young women. Now, Omar Basin is on, and he quotes the Medrash Rabba. And the Medrash Rabba should be because of Onsen, the Yoko Moshe Meishim. It wasn't just that they drove them away so they couldn't uh, water their, 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 uh, their, their sheep, their flock. They tried to attack them, they tried to violate them, they tried to rape them. And Moshe stops that. So listen to this. They tried to, uh, as I just said, to violate them. And Moshe comes and he saves them. And that's what it says in Devorim. It's talking there, in the Torah's talk in the context of a young woman is walking along the way, maybe by the side of the field that she's taken and grabbed and raped. And she's a, a uh, she's engaged to be married to somebody else. It could never be seen um, as an, a, that she was she acquiesced. That was a liaison um, because uh, she's in the middle of the field and she couldn't shout. Nobody's going to hear her. Um, but here they shout out. That's what it says. But actually, near us because that's what the pasuk says. But Omra, but ye goshum, amen. And they, it's in the masculine, chase them away. Now, as the Art scroll reasonably translates it. It's that they um, chased the woman away, but then it's in the wrong. It's the wrong. Uh, uh, um, uh, it's the wrong Hebrew there. Viegoshum, viegoshun, it should say. But here it means that the woman chased the men away. How did these young women chase these strong shepherds away? 
because when they came and they drew the water and they filled the troughs, as the Yovah arrived and straight after that, as the Pasuk says, along came the shepherds, and suddenly it's Chaber him to grab them. But as the Gershom, Hain, but they chased the men away, Hain, the woman, and Sarayim, Me'alehem, Betzaka, by calling out, help, somebody help me. And of course, there was somebody there to help them, and that was Moshe Rabbeinu. Kitzaka and the Aras, Lavachish, Mashiach, because they're looking for somebody to come and help them. Yovah, Lashiach, and along comes the person who will do that, as Moshe, and Lavrayim, Hara, Apai, and Moshe gets angry with these people trying to rape these girls. But Yochum, but Yashem, Mele, Onus, and he stops them being attacked. But Gam, Hitzel, Me, Nehem, the Yashka, and Sodom, and not only that, he takes it over and he himself waters the, the remaining sheep. Uh, he, he waters the sheep. And what he did, what they did in driving off the shepherds, albeit through the, inter, the invited in, uh, intervention of Moshe, was to be able to, 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 to uh, operate as ma- a male role driving them off. By seeking the alliance of Moshe, or the intervention of Moshe, uh, they drove away the shepherds. That's normally what a man would do in a physical attack. So it, 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 it hints at that in, in, the, uh, in the men, the Yagoshum, making it the masculine. Then he wants to talk about the, the Alshach wants to talk about this idea of the, the Tzorn of the Hem. It says that they came to, um, uh, to water their father's flock. And then it talks about uh, their flock. The Possex says their flock, Moshe, what is their flock? And then it just says, the flock. He, they came and reported that this Egyptian man w- w- saved us and watered the flock. So what were these different definitions of what constituted that flock? What were these sheep all about? So he says something which I think is interesting. Well, I'm at Chil Hashka's sign of the M. First of all, it says they watered the father's flock. Ba'aka Cain, Omer, and Sodom. And then they, it's referred to as their flock. Moshe watered their flock. And Ba'aka Gaius just says, Hatsa. You're talking, since they were young women, they weren't children, they were young women, they weren't girls. Now, in the, in, the, in the world in those times, it was very often uh, the woman, a girl, would be given a dowry, and the dowry could easily be, would easily be, this is discussed in the Gomorrah many, many times, um, town Basel, it's called, being the property that a woman brings into a marriage, there is dowry in this town barzo, that is, she could bring in property into the marriage, which she retains ownership of, and then there's property she brings into the marriage, uh, which uh, is a, a gift to the husband, uh, and that is going to be just generally a dowry. So he says that there, as these are young women, it's not a, impossible to imagine uh, that these, the, the sheep, some of the sheep belong to the father and some of their own. Okay, it's part of their dowry. But so on shall it be him. And therefore, so now they've got their some of the sheep are theirs and some of the sheep belong to the father. Where would you what would, who would you expect them to be watering flock? Uh, what sheep would you expect them to water first? Well, obviously the fathers, if they have a Jewish sensitivity, there's a mix of key without the aim. So here's another interesting insight into these young women. They water the father's flock first. Um, that's why it says. They go and they draw water for their fathers. But they didn't have a chance yet to water their own flock because along come the shepherds. And Moshe has to come and intervene. And when he intervenes, and it says he watered their, so not their flock, that's the sheep that they, that, that they own that belongs to them. Shariba S, the word S. Because S always means something extra. That means to say the water, the flocks, both flocks uh, were, were watered at that time. Moshe, their flock, and then watering their father's flock. But then Mamram Omra says, Dola Dola, and that's why it said, when they repeat to the father that to Dola Dola, it's, refer, it's referring to the fact that the, there was two, two uh, uh, actions of watering the flocks. One was uh, their own watering, uh, watering their father's flock, and Moshe. Doing the same for them. Uh, we wash, we watered your flocks, and then he waters our flocks. Um, and afterwards, he, then when they report this, they say, the flock it means both, both together were, were, were watered. And watering ours 
that referred to the fact that uh, yours was already watered by us. Fine. Good. Um, that's the al There's a little bit of al there. there. Um, as I am experimenting, trying to keep this not too long. I'm feeling a bit guilty about the 58 or 59 minutes of last week's share. Let's move on to an interesting thing, uh, insight from the Sefer Bear Yosef. Now, of course, as I pointed out, that um, as the Pasuk says, that Moshe then goes on to become the shepherd of, of uh, the flock of Yisrael. So here is a Medrash Rabbah. So again, this is a Sefer Bear Yosef. And Sefer Bar Yosef says this. It quotes a Medrash Rabbah. Um, it's Daf, uh, and, and Daf uh, Mem Hay, if, you, uh, if you're looking for it. And it says the following thing. Um, Hashem doesn't give uh, or doesn't appoint somebody to a position of greatness until he's first tested and tried them in a, in a minor, a junior position. Um, that's the same. Uh, you can see that with the two greats, two of the greats of, 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 the, of, of Jewish history of the world. Uh, Hashem tested them at something small but subsequently promoted them to some to greatness because of the passing that test, none of them being charged with something great. And then when the Glomo, Bode Glomo, it's like, David was tested through being a shepherd. Omele HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Nimsa Ata Nem of Ebetzon, Boro Atzani. You were, I find you faithful and reliable, dependable with your flock. Now come and shepherd my flock, the Jewish people. This is the Medrash. Became Moshe, who Oimer began against Simon, and same with Moshe, as the Pasuk goes on to say, as I told you, he then becomes a shepherd of Yisrael's flock. Same idea. Local Kodesh Baruch Hu says Israel. Hashem took him to therefore look after Klal Yisrael. Fine, and we've got another medrash, um, and this is makes the the the, the point uh, even stronger uh, by giving us details. Um, and, and, the, and again, the medrash says. Um, Hashem judges or tests a tzaddik first before he, he appoints him to position uh, within the Jewish people. He, he, he tested uh, David by being a shepherd and they found him as faithful, a faithful shepherd. What happened? When David used to let come to new grazing with his flock, he would, with, with, he would hold back the older sheep so that the younger sheep could graze first, because the younger sheep can only graze the soft grass, the easy grass and the easy shrubs, soft, whereas the older sheep with bigger teeth, they can get, they can still eat the, the more difficult uh, grass, the harder grass. And so that's what, he, that's how David looked after the sheep. Seeing that he was so concerned, then Hashem gave him that, uh, uh, realizing that sensitivity, then he would be perfect for the king of the Jewish people. And that's where it's at. After Moshe, Lloyd, being the Kodesh Baruch Hu, again, he, he, he uh, tested him through being a shepherd. And it says there, Amr of Rabbi Sino, Kshay Yomosh Rabbeinu, Allah of Rabbi Sino, Shal Yisra, Bamid, Bar Baruch Hu, Menu, Gidi, Vrat, Akrav, Achis, Dam, Lloyd, Baricha, Shalmayim, Omad, Hagidi, Lishtais. One day, a little lamb or a little baby sheep runs away um, and Moshe chases after it um, and finds him by a little, a little well, a little uh, spring, drinking. And he says, oh, I didn't realize that you ran away because you were thirsty. He then takes the sheep on, its, on his shoulder and carries the sheep back. Uh, if, as you were poor thing, you were tired. And he carried him back to the flock. Um, as you are looking at your your particular to look after the property of a, of a of a of a man of a human being, a man of flesh and blood, I Yisro, you look after his flock so nicely. You go after my flock, the Jewish people. That's the the two midrashim. And Rabbi uh, 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 Salant asks the rather obvious question. That's illogical. We're all familiar with the concept of, I think it's got a name, is it Murphy's Law or something like that? When somebody is promoted 
and promoted. He's good at the job. He gets promoted to the next level and the next level, the management position and the senior management position. Eventually, he gets promoted uh, because of his capabilities and abilities to the point where he can't be promoted anymore because he's been promoted to the point of his inabilities when he's unable, when he's not qualified. And there's a certain irony there. But it's, if somebody proves themselves to be um, exceptional in something small, does that suggest for one moment that he could be exceptional in something big? Imagine a child, um, uh, you know, takes a, a, a plug uh, and rewires the plug. And the wire comes out and a little boy of eight or nine, especially in, in Britain where they're able to take plugs apart and put the wiring in and is able to, to make the plug work. Say, oh, that's a wonderful son. Great, tomorrow I'd like you to rewire the entire house. That's a non sequitur, it doesn't make any sense. It's illogical. Just because the kid could do a simple job like rewiring a plug, so they say, good work, rewire a house. That's a big job. That means expertise. You can look after sheep, you should look after all the Jewish people. What does that mean? And here, Strauss and I wrote this story, but Yosef Salanta says something which I think is absolutely beautiful. Really, what it means is like this it's hardly, he says, you know, what, he's aware of this question. He's aware of that. That doesn't make sense. What does make sense is that Moshe Rabbeinu, when he's reached the highest level, remember, Hashem is about to speak to him. He's got to the spiritual level of a Lokom Yisrael Kamoshe Od. That's one of the reasons why all, almost all of the greats of the Jewish people were shepherds. Shepherds allows you the process of his boidus. His boidus means introspection, spiritual growth, and be, being able to be on your own to consider who you are without the bilbul, without the, the uh, uh, hustle and bustle of, of society and being in the middle of a city or the middle of a town. It was, a, it was the ideal uh, role or ideal job for somebody who's looking to grow spiritually. And of course, uh, Moshe was the greatest who ever lived and there's so many madrashim, he brings many madrashim about Moshe Rabbeinu, what he did, who he was, his level, uh, could, could speak to Hashem. But still, he's able to take that little lamb on his shoulders and willing to take that lamb on his shoulders and carry it back. That's the point. The point is that your greatness, which you had, and the same with Zohar Demelech, you've reached incredibly high levels. But that doesn't mean to say at any way that you are uh, embarrassed, ashamed. Um, it's be below your dignity to look after a sheep or a lamb. He runs after the lamb. He carries it in his shoulder. It's never the case, as Rasa Salam goes on to say, it's never the case that the greats of the Jewish people are distant from the Jewish people. There's a beautiful story which I like very much, told to me by an old friend of mine in London. Um, we, were, uh, we lived together in Gates of Yeshiva. Um, he's got Rabbi Zimmerman. And he told me once again, a Rebbe uh, was walking along the sea front of Bat Yam, I think it was, and there was a pair of uh, legs sticking out a, a car which were jacked up and somebody was underneath the car banging and crashing and trying to fix it. And the Rebbe with his entourage, uh, a flock of, of black, as Hasidiba walking down the front, sees this fellow lying there and that fellow's hands coming out and patting the, patting the pavement, patting the sidewalk, looking for a wrench that he'd left there. So the Rebbe bent down and he said, and he read Mata what would you like? Because oh, new roads, uh, whatever wrenches in Hebrew. And uh, as, they said, as they said, uh, which side? So there's a, he tells him the size. So he gives it to him and he starts to talk to him. And of course, the fellow doesn't know who's, who, he's, who he's talking to because he's underneath the car. And they have this whole conversation about, I don't know, just normal stuff, family, football, whatever. And eventually he's on one of these little wheelie things, um, a little trolley thing, and he pulls himself out and his eyeballs nearly pop out his head as he sees this great rabbi with a big beard and his entourage. It was the Gary Rebbe. Wow. Of course, they think it was the Gary Rebbe. The greatest of the Jewish people can talk to the littlest. Even if they're a great person, they can talk to the little person. That's what it means. That really means if you, I tested you with the little, little things and then you got to the great thing. I saw you with just little lambs. Sheep, and you could you can be in charge of people. No, no, you can be in charge of people because you're great enough to be in charge of people. But you're great enough to be in charge of people at the highest levels because you can still talk to people at the ordinary levels. And that's an important message. The greats of Cloud and Stroll are defined by their ordinariness. 
Well, when I first met my Rosh Hashim, Rabbi Gurbitz, my late brother-in-law, Rabbi Shalom, who was just in those days a friend of mine, uh, said, what did you think? I said, it was incredible. He was talking to me, he was for hearing me, testing me to see if I was a stand to get into gates of yeshiva, which I wasn't, by the way, uh, but it let me in nevertheless. And then he said to me, his, his, his late wife had passed away, would you like a cup of tea? And I said, oh, no, all right. And then he came with a tray with tea and sugar and milk and fruit, <laughs> banana and an apple. How do you eat a banana in front of a Rosh Hashiva? Uh, and, he, and my brother-in-law said, what did you make of it? He was, he was so nice and just ordinary, just understood everything I was talking about. He said, Rav Leib is great enough to be ordinary. And that's a beautiful phrase. It applies to all our good island. They're still good island, but they're great enough to be ordinary. And certainly that was the case with Moshe Rabbeinu. I'll see you all again next week. Have a very good Shabbos.